begin our service and worshiping together. This is my Father's world. This is my Father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round we rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand of wonders wrought. singing, but I have been singing that song the last few weeks as I've appreciated the beauty of God's handiwork and the changing leaves. Anybody with me out there? Has it been a beautiful autumn so well? 2020 has stole a lot of things from us, but it sure didn't steal the beauty of the uh, of this season. So uh, I trust you've been able to enjoy that. Well, welcome to everyone. Glad that you're here uh, today, whether you're online or you're in person. We're glad that you've chosen to be with us. I'm going to call our hearts to worship this morning uh, by reading some verses from Psalm 33. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Have you ever paused to think that your voices of praise are heard by God and He thinks they are beautiful, no matter what you might think? The worship from uh, a heart, a full heart, is a beautiful thing to our Lord. Anyway, we continue with Psalm 33. Sing to him a new song, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Our God is good, and he enjoys giving good things to his people, even God's daily blessings, just like the, the changing of the leaves in the autumn time is proof positive of God's goodness and that he loves us and he cares for his own. You know that expression, God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Amen. Well, we're going to continue with a song that allows us corporately to declare God's goodness. No matter what our situation might be today, God is good and to worship him as our refuge and the king of our hearts.
down You're never gonna You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna You're never gonna let me down We go, we sing it
friends. Hi, friends. It's so good to worship our Lord together. Um, this is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those who have trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Isn't that so cool to think about? Like God loves us, comforts us so that we can then go out into the world and comfort others. And I just, I love that God has that call throughout His Word for us. Um, we're gonna sing another song coming up. It's called A Hopeful People. And it's a song we wrote together a couple years ago at Christ Community Church and our worship team. And it really has a call, a, like a call to help us remember who we are. We are God's children and we are hopeful. In fact, later on in this uh, verse, it says, and our hope for you, God is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Guys, there's so much that brings me comfort this time of year, the fall leaves, even this Bible that I was gifted when I first reclaimed my faith in my early 20s. There's a lot that's bringing me comfort, but there's also a lot in this world right now that is bringing just a lot of uh, concern for us all. We keep saying it, but the year 2020 has been crazy and we do feel that too. But the difference for us, the reason why we can be a hopeful people is because we have placed our faith in something higher than all of the mess that we see here. So would you take a minute with me and let's pray that God would help us to live out His call upon our lives to be a hopeful people, people who share the comfort that we've been given through our faith in Christ Jesus. So would you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you for all the ways that you love us so well, for your ultimate sacrifice through your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our salvation and replaced our suffering, our endless torment, all of that with hope and promise of a, of a better tomorrow, of a future that is filled with nothing but joy. So God, help us to live right now in the midst of the moments that we are living through, right this moment, God, as hopeful people of God, firm in our faith, but softened in our hearts, God. As you comfort us, may we be a comfort to this world, to the people of this world who need you, God. Bring us, bring us wisdom, bring us your patience, Strengthen us, God. Send your spirit. Make us attentive to the sounds of the Holy Spirit, God, as we walk our days, the days to come especially, God. We pray in the days to come. This is a crazy moment. We all feel it. But God, you are higher than all this. So as we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and we remember that our comfort comes through our faith, would you make us a hopeful people? In your name I pray, amen. We are people full of hope, though trouble finds us in this world. We set our joy on what's to darkness tries to steal away our peace of mind. We set our joy on Jesus Christ. Would you stand and sing with me, church? We are a hopeful people. We have a strength unshakable. Our God is always here with us. No longer left to Through your 
joining us today, whether you're on site or online, we believe that God has something great in store for you today. And we wanna know who you are. We'd love to connect with you today. If you just take a moment either right now or after the service is over to fill out our connection form, it's just a few simple questions about you so we can connect with you and get you plugged into life-giving community. Soul Care 2020. It's just over one month away and I am excited for this conference. If you go right now to soulcareconference.com, you can sign up, find out more information about what this conference is. It's gonna be a marriage conference that really focuses on spouses, being able to love one another really well, being able to, to love God really well, and it's going to minister deeply to your soul. So sign up for that conference today. Hey everybody, just wanted to give you a financial update of how things are going at Christ Community Church. The third quarter is finished and we've got some updated information for you. As you can imagine, the coronavirus has been difficult on the church as it has been on so many other institutions. We've done our very best to trim our budgets and to take advantage of the PPP program and still we've got some challenges in the budget arena. Just for pure honesty, uh, August and September were two of our toughest months of the year, where giving was about at 80% of the normal amount that we would love to be able to see happen in order to be able to optimize ministry at Christ Community Church. So I wanna make a special appeal to all of you who are out there. If you're somebody who considers Christ Community Church your church home, would you sign up at cccomaha.org slash give for some kind of regular giving? Maybe for you it's a specific dollar amount that you'd like to give every other week or every month. Maybe you're somebody who'd like to give a particular percentage, 2%, 5%, or maybe you're ready to bring in the full tithe of 10% and give it to the local church. It's a time in our culture where we could really use it, and it is your spiritual act of worship. So let me invite you to be a generous giver because generosity is one of the hallmarks of Christ Community Church. Or maybe you're somebody who doesn't consider Christ Community your church home, but you say, man, I've been watching online. I have loved this Revelation series. It has ministered to my soul. Maybe you've gotten one of these guides via PDF or through the mail. And we really wanted to make these guides available for free for anybody who wanted to grow in their faith, even during our tough budget cycle. And if you're somebody who says, I'm new to Christ Community, but I've loved the Revelation series, maybe you'd love to make a one-time gift to be able to say, hey, if I could defray the costs of these guides for everybody who needs them so we could give away thousands for free, that would be fantastic. You too can give at cccomaha.org slash give. We'll set things up in such a way that it makes it easy as pie for you to be able to make your gifts to the church, even if you live somewhere else totally in the country. Well now, I would love to hand things over to Jed Logue. Jed is gonna be our preacher for this morning. And I just wanna let you guys know that this is Jed's very first time preaching from the big stage. 
So whenever we have a first time preacher, we put away our critics caps and we pull out our foam fingers and we cheer them on as they come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray a prayer for Jed and then I want you guys to welcome him with a great big applause. Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much that you give us the opportunity to be able to learn from your word on a week by week basis. We love you. We're grateful for you and your presence here. Now we pray that you would empower Jed and open up our hearts and teach us more about the fall of Babylon and how that relates to our world today. We invite your presence. We invite you to be our teacher. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. And all of God's people, welcome Jed to the stage with a raucous set of applause. Let's give it up for Jed Loeb. Wow, I just can feel the love. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark, for that awesome introduction. I love getting to serve with you. And thanks to Christ Community Church uh, just for your love and support. Uh, I've been here on staff now for almost you know, seven and a half years. I'm in my eighth year. My wife and our two daughters have been in Omaha for about eight years. We're a very artistic home. If you couldn't already put two and two together, we love to sing, we love to dance, we love to create. Things at our house get a little bit silly, as you might uh, expect. There's always some project going on, and uh, it's a joy for us to get to serve God in the local church here. Well, if you're joining along with us, uh, maybe today's your first day. We're in week 11 of a 16-week series through the book of Revelation. This is a uh, uh, quite a journey that we've been on. Uh, the book of Revelation is all about uh, vivid imagery and prophetic language that was given to a guy named John. John was one of the disciples who walked with Jesus. And in the later years of his life, he was given this vision that he recorded, sent out to uh, several of the churches in the area as kind of a, a picture of what the end times would look like. If you've got your guide, uh, we're gonna be looking at page 42 today. There's some message notes on the pages before. It's gonna be a helpful uh, tool for you to kind of see what's going on going on here. Uh, so far where we've been is we've seen the letters to the churches and, and the admonitions and the uh, encouragements and the warnings to them to follow Jesus, to keep going. We've seen a picture of the throne room of heaven and what worship is going to look like. And every single week where we gather, whether here on site or at home online, we've got an amazing team of people who are giving up their talents and gifts to just give us a picture of what that's going to look like. Uh, worship is one of those things that connects me to God in such a way that really uh, helps me to, to feel his presence. And I know for many of you, it does there too. And then we've been in the last several weeks in this portion of the book of Revelation that really takes up a bulk of the chapters uh, known as the tribulation. Last week, Mark did a great job of kind of outlining the series of events, when they take place, the three and a half years leading up to the midpoint, and then the rapture where Christians go to meet with Jesus, and then the final half of the tribulation. If you haven't already looked, uh, you can find all those messages online on our YouTube channel or on our website, and I encourage you to check check that out for a good overview last week. But today, we're going to be in primarily two chapters of the book of Revelation. So if you have a Bible, you'd like to get that out and follow along. Chapters 17 and 18 is we're gonna be spending the bulk of our time. And again, uh, page 42 in your guide. You guys are ready to run. This is a lot of text we're gonna cover and I'm gonna do my very best to make sense of it for us uh, without putting you to sleep. I promise, I promise. All right, so let's read. Uh, chapter 17, right from the top, verses one through six. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Okay, lots going on here. John's shown the punishment of a prostitute. This is a, a woman who sits by many waters on a scarlet-colored, colored, seven-headed, ten-horned beast covered with blasphemous names. 
She's presenting herself as she's dressed like a queen and she's holding up this cup full of abominable things, blasphemous things and all the evil that she represents. She has a title, Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes of, and of the abominations of the earth. And she's drunk on the blood of the saints of Jesus. This woman is bad news. Pretending to be a queen, drunk on the blood of God's people and a beast rider. Now you might be thinking, this sounds a little bit like the beast from chapter 13 that we uh, learned about last week. Seven heads, 10 horns, not the same beast. Now the beast that we're seeing here is another picture of kind of an interconnected thing. It's an evil that exists that's, that's driving this power that we see. And this is a different account here. Uh, the, the woman and the beast aren't necessarily literal. We talked about that a little bit last week too. Rather, they're symbolic of something bigger. Behind the symbolism is uh, the evil that undergirds everything that has taken place and the structures that perpetuate the evil. So the beast represents the evil the woman represents Babylon. And in order to better understand what's going on here, I think it's important for us to just kind of go back into our diagram that's on page 42. Hopefully you've got it there by now. And if you don't have a physical copy, you can go online and you can get one really quick. No problem there. Uh, and let's go ahead and take a look at that together. Now, Babylon was a real city that existed in ancient biblical times. It was located along the Euphrates River in what is now modern day Iraq. And there's a map up there for you to kind of help locate that. And fun fact about Babylon, Noah, you guys know Noah, the guy who built the ark? Yeah, his great grandson, Nimrod, was the founder of the city of Babylon. And any city founded by a guy named Nimrod just can't be good. I mean, Nimrod. So Babylon, we find in chapter 11 of Genesis, is the location of the Tower of Babel. Let's read this. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Those are the people who gathered together in a rebellious act to build something so that they could reach the heavens. It was said that this tower may have actually been inspired by the patron god of Babylon, Marduk. It was an idolatrous act of rebellion that was unified to usurp the rightful place of the one true God, Yahweh. To the builders, Babel meant the gate of God. We'll become like gods. We'll reach the heavens. But it's rightly translated as a place of confusion. And God saw what these people were doing. He says, no, 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 no. You guys are not me. There's nothing you could do to ever be me. And instead, he scattered them throughout the earth and confused their language. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. So Babylon's origins are rooted in two things. Rebellion against God and confusion among its people. If we move outward into the next uh, two rings of the diagram, you see the center of power and Jews in exile. So Babylon became a major influential city and later a powerful empire. At its peak, Babylon is described as having been just flourishing in art and architecture. It was surrounded by three rings of walls, each reaching 40 feet in height. A Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the walls were so thick that they used to do chariot races around them. This is a pretty big city. Within the walls, the city covered 200 square miles, about the same size as Chicago. Pretty impressive. Babylon was ruled by Nebuchadnezzar II. This is the same ruler that you read of in 2 Kings 24 and 25 and in Daniel around the time of the Jewish exile. And you can kind of see there where Jerusalem is located in relation to Babylon. The Babylonians laid siege to Jerusalem. They robbed the temple and the royal places of all the gold artifacts and they burned the temple and the royal places to the ground, ultimately bringing the Jews into exile where they would stay for the next 70 plus years. This is where all the bitterness and the resentment from the Jewish people began to build around Babylon, the nation of evil that slaughtered their people, smashed their temple, and decimated their land. So we've got the Tower of Babel, the center of power, and the Jewish exile. And then next we move into our next outward circle, which is Rome. 
Okay, so how does Rome get into the picture? I thought we were talking about Babylon. Well, let's read. Verse nine of 17 says, this calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. For the audience to whom John is writing, the first uh, century early Christians, this passage would have been unmistakably understood as Rome. Ancient Rome was built atop seven hills, and much like Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's day, Rome was the center of power economically, politically, militarily. It was the place that was in charge, and they would have recognized this seven-headed monster that was referred to as seven hills would have been Rome. They would have said, okay, that's like Rome. Rome existed at its height from all the way to the Euphrates River on up through the entirety of the Mediterranean Basin to Western Europe where Britain is. It was the world as the first century uh, audience would have known. The significance of Rome being referenced in Revelation 17 is that Rome is a type of Babylon. Babylon was a real place, but it was something bigger in Revelation a corrupt system of power that has existed since the original sin way back in the Garden of Eden marked by false promises, self-centeredness, greed, and idol worship. And a place where those in authority sought to make a name for themselves and take the rightful place of God. And now as we move out to our final outward circle on your diagram, if you're still following along, we see powerful cities, nations, empires that have existed throughout history and into the future and the end times as well. For John and the first century audience, this is recognized in Rome. They knew just how powerful Rome was and how puny they were. And for us, we see this type of Babylon in our current day systems of governments and the corrupt and oppressive power structures that are at work. You know, if you remember back to your history lessons, moment in, moments in recent history like the conquests of the South and Central Americas, the transatlantic slave trade, the westward expansion of the United States and the mistreatment of the indigenous peoples along the way, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, and not to mention the current hot button, uneasy climate of today's political landscape. It's pretty easy to see this structure at work even today. This calls for a mind of wisdom. That's why John writes that, I believe. This calls for a mind of wisdom. Lord, we need your wisdom. So let's get back to the meaning of the woman and the beast. We understand Babylon now in verse seven. The Bible explains who these characters are. I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and 10 horns. And in verse 18, you read, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. The woman is Babylon. It's in her title. It's what John is seeing represented in Rome. It's being foretold of the corrupt system that exists throughout history, today, and into the future. And it builds in intensity as the years and the centuries roll on and on up to this point that we see here in the end times. And there's a really uh, vivid description of what goes on if you read the uh, first part of chapter 18. Babylon becomes a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every impure spirit, unclean bird, unclean and detestable animal. All nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth have committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. That's a description of Babylon, what it becomes in the future. The beast itself and its seven heads and 10 horns explained like this, the seven heads are seven kings. The first century audience may have understood this to be past major emperors of Rome the five that have fallen, the one who was and the one who is yet to come. The one who was was possibly Nero, possibly Domitian. We don't really know. But the one thing to remember here is this eighth king, which is the beast itself. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king, verse eight. 
He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. So this eighth king who is the beast aligned with the seven who have gone before is going to rise up into the future only to be destroyed by Jesus himself. The 10 horns that are on this beast are also 10 future kings. And Mark did a a good job of kind of explaining the meaning of this. Horns means like the symbol of power or authority. And this could be some type of a 10 nation, 10 ruler alliance. We just don't really know. Um, But what we do know is that the purpose of this uh, this ruler, this, this beast, these horns is to have one purpose and that is to wage war against Jesus. But it will only be for a short time because once again, guess what? Yep, Jesus wins, he overcomes. In the first verses of one through six, there's one other important symbol that I wanna uh, mention and that's the waters. It's explained in verse 15. The waters on which the prostitute sits are Peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So a quick recap, the woman is Babylon, this corrupt system of power. The beast that she rides is the corrupt kings and rulers uh, that perpetuate this system of power. And the waters are the corrupted peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Hey, this is good news, right? (laughs) I'm just kidding. This is like heavy stuff, heavy stuff. Can I tell you a story from my, my childhood? I'm gonna tell you anyway, so buckle up. (laughs) When I was a kid, about eight or nine, uh, I just kind of started to play baseball. I was in Little League. Any Little Leaguers out there? Anybody who has a Little Leaguer, maybe you play softball, you kind of understand what what you're talking about. I love baseball. I think if there was one sport that I might've had a chance at like being something, it could have been baseball. Because in baseball, you don't have to be the tallest, you don't have to be the strongest, you don't have to be the most athletic. It's like a skill sport. And I think, you know, back in that day, I certainly wasn't the tallest, I wasn't the strongest, and I wasn't the most athletic. And, you know, like back in gym when they would say, okay, line up from tallest to shortest, I'd come over to this side thinking I was one of the taller kids, and slowly I'd go, no, okay. And eventually I'd kind of make my way down toward the end of the line, you know. I think, let's be honest, if we were to do that right now with everybody here at home, I'd still be on this side. I'm just not gifted with height. It's just the way God made me. But I remember I was just starting to play the game. I was just learning. I was maybe second grade, third grade. And there was this kid on the other team, Abel Tree Service, his name was Aaron. And Aaron seemed like a giant to me. He had to have been six feet tall, six feet tall, second grader who shaved. I don't know how. (laughs) This kid was huge. He threw a fastball that seemed like 90 miles per hour. I was just learning how to swing a bat and it was my turn to bat. And that day, like every kid got a turn to bat at least once and it was my one turn of the game. And I remember stepping into the batter's box. My heart was pumping, my knees were shaking. And I remembered my coach saying, the strike zone's from like where the letters hit on your jersey to your knees. So I was like. (laughs) I think, I think. I think in my mind I was going, there's gonna be two outcomes here. Either I'm gonna get hit by a pitch and die, maybe I'll get a walk, and by some miraculous thing, I might like close my eyes, swing, and actually hit the ball. People from the stands, like the kids, they said chatter, chatter, they're like, easy out, easy out, come on, we got this. Even the parents were saying easy out. I'm like, what is going on here? I'm in the batter's box shaking and quaking and it was easy. It was an easy out. One, two, three, I was done. (laughs) And those voices that came, there was a couple, see, I kept playing the game and there was always two voices that I was starting to hear more of. And this may not be everybody's story. I had, I had some awesome parents growing up. But through all the noise and all, a lot of it was in my own head, there were two voices saying, hey, that's okay, Jed, you'll get it next time. Keep swinging, we're proud of you. You can do it, keep going, don't give up. You might be looking at all of Revelation, what we've been reading for the last couple of weeks and say, who can stand against this type of power? There's something going on here that's big. Beasts, seven heads, horns, all the world's drunk off the the same stuff. Like what's going on? I I, I don't feel like anybody could stand. And I wanna tell you that there's another voice who says to the church, hey, you, 
you got this. Jesus has won. He's with you. Don't listen to the noise that's around you. Don't, don't listen to them that says you can't go on. Don't listen to them that say you should give up. Don't listen to them that say you gotta be just like the world. Jesus is on your side. He's saying keep going, keep doing it, keep swinging, keep coming, keep coming to church, keep worshiping, keep praying, keep praising. You got this. I am your king and I'm behind you. I've given you a new name. Come on. You're not left alone to stand, God is with you. Babylon is real, it exists, it's all around us. We see it if we open our eyes, we just know it's happening. This corrupt system of oppressive power, it's there. But we're part of a much bigger, stronger family of God. <laughs> We've been invited by the power of God and his Holy Spirit and listen to this new name that he gives you. He says, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's one of my favorite verses, 1 Peter 2, verse nine. The woman's given some adulterous titles which are well-fitting for her, but you, church, you're given the name of holy, royal, chosen, a people of God. And guess what? God's extending that invitation to say, I want, I want one more on my team. I want you to be on it. You might not think you're much, but I see the potential in you. And with Jesus on your life, you can do something for me. He's extending that invitation of grace. And what we've seen right now, we're in an age of grace where God's wrath is being withheld. His judgment is being withheld because he loves us. He says, I can't dwell in the presence of darkness and of sin. And we've got a sin problem that's infected us and it's stronger than any pandemic. But the thing is, Jesus has overcome that. And he says, even in the midst of that, I'm gonna withhold my wrath, my righteous judgment so that you can come into my kingdom. Hear my voice, follow me, follow me. And we're seeing that even through the, the beginning of this tribulation period, the, the warnings that God is saying, hey, don't, don't miss out, don't miss out. This isn't for you. You're people that I created in my image and I want you to follow me. And we read even up to this last opportunity in, verse, in chapter 18, verse four, it says, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. God's got a punishment and a judgment. It's not for you, it's for her. It's for this system, it's for this evil. And he says, come out of her. It's one more invitation to follow Jesus. But it's also the last one we see in scripture. Why the last? Because God's righteous judgment is coming. This corrupt system of Babylon is about to be done away with once and for all. And God wants to squeeze every last drop of grace out of the, the world to get every single person with him in his arms. And we see a look at this final judgment, the beginnings of this, if we read in verse 21, it says, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and he threw it into the sea. And he said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The fall of Babylon is imminent and there will be great mourning and suffering and pain as a result. Within an hour, scripture teaches us. Within an hour, what took years and years and centuries and centuries of human hands and effort to build, God puts to ruin in an instant. The whole system gone. Now, what we, what we see in response to this fall, and I think it's an appropriate response, what we see, we see three woes that are, that are followed by three hallelujahs, three cries of mourning and suffering followed by three cries of triumphant praise. I'm gonna read through them real quick and summarize them for you. See the kings of the earth, they will weep, mourn, and cry. These are the rulers, these are the power players, these are the ones that are kind of driving the systems of authority. Then you see those who make a living by the earth, the merchants of the earth, 
the same thing. They're looking at all their factories, all their industry, everything that they've known, how they've made their, their resources, what they've built, gone. And they're weeping and they're mourning, and they're crying, and we see merchants of the sea, those, those who have made their living through, through trade over the, the sea. And this, again, was written to the first century. I want you to think of a city that you love. My wife is from the East Coast. She's a Maina. She's from Maine. Anybody been to Maine? They say weird things in Maine. <laughs> I love my wife, but she says things like, Martha, Martha. And she adds R's to words that aren't there, like she has an idea instead of an idea. It's weird. It's just weird. But uh, for a lot of our married life, we've lived away from her family uh, here in the Midwest and in the Southeast. And we'd always try to get at least one trip up to see her family in the summertime. And it's, it, they're, they're most, mostly they're awesome times. And we get there, we either drive or we fly. But pretty much every time we've gone through New York City. There's an old musical called Wicked. Anybody hear of it? One short day in the Emerald City. My daughter, when she was eight, she used to call it One Orc City. And we would sing One Short Day in One Orc City. It was awesome. Empire State Building, just the beautiful architecture, the culture, the musicals, the energy. It was awesome. Maybe for you, it's another city. You can think of it like, I love LA, Chicago, Denver, Maybe you've been fortunate enough to travel overseas. You've seen Tokyo, London, Paris. <laughs> Maybe it's just Omaha. You're like, I just love Omaha. No city like it. It's the best. The culture here, the people here, everything in it. And there's a, an appropriate mournful response because what you see, what you've fallen in love with is all wiped off the map in a moment, music gone, workers gone, industry gone, city lights gone, marriages, families gone. But as good as cities are, and as much as we appreciate and love them and, and love what they bring, there's this ugly underbelly that exists within every one. Homelessness, poverty, disease, human suffering, exploitation of people, idol worship. And God wants to do away with that system and he will and we're seeing a glimpse of it here in Revelation. It's like he's saying, Babylon, you thought you were something. You thought that you could go on forever. You thought that no one could stand against you but guess what? The Lord will come in his right and righteous judgment. You led people astray, Babylon. In Babylon, the blood of God's prophets and his holy people were found and all who have been slaughtered on the earth. Contrasting to the mournful responses we see in chapter 18, we see three responses of hallelujahs. Three times proclaiming the goodness of God by the multitudes in heaven, saints and angels alike. Not in the destruction or the discomfort of people. It's not like they're saying, see, I told you. That's not the heart of it. That's not what they're rejoicing over. They're rejoicing over the fact that God's righteous hand of judgment and truth are upon the world once and for all. Finally, it's like they've been groaning. And we see here in verse, verse two of chapter 19, hallelujah, true and just are God's judgments. We see in verse three, hallelujah, the justice goes up forever. It's not like God makes the judgment and then in a period of time later, he has to make the, the next judgment. And then after that, he has to say, well, I gotta make another one. No, God's ways are forever, forever. Hallelujah. Verse six, hallelujah. Our Lord God almighty reigns. Amen. Can you say amen church? Hallelujah, say it with me, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, you are right, you are true, you are holy, hallelujah. I feel a song coming on. See, we are not left alone. God doesn't say, hey, I see you there and I don't care. He doesn't say, I don't care what you're dealing with. 
I don't care that you're feeling oppressed. I don't care that something has taken advantage of you. Someone has been taking advantage of you. I don't care that you're in this system where the whole purpose of it is to bring you to death and destruction and ruin. He says, no, I'm with you. I stand behind you. I am for you. I've given you a new name. Your name is chosen, holy, righteous, part of my royal priesthood. And I want you to be with me in heaven. This is something to cause hope in our lives, church. We get hopeful about this. I want us to stand and let's sing. Let's declare the praises of God. We are a hopeful people, church. Let's sing this out. We are a hopeful people. Somebody say, I'm chosen. I'm royal. I'm holy. I'm a person of God. And Lord Jesus, we accept that today. We receive that truth from you to know that you have called us to be light in this world of darkness, to stand against the powers of evil, and to know that with you, we are the victorious ones. You win the battle, you win the fight. In the name of Jesus, the church of God, with glorious and triumphant power, says amen, amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great week.